dealt with here in Chesterdale, Romania, and we're looking in Daniel chapter uh, 8, and we kind of ended at an inconvenient place uh, uh, right before we were talking about the 2300 evenings and mornings in verse 14, and we were looking at 13. And try to catch up right quick. Um, Daniel would start out here his vision. He was seeing. Uh, we had to be talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. That's uh, almost certain because he did some, these same things that the Antichrist will do in the future. Uh, that's to come. And so, um, but he cannot be the Antichrist. This cannot be the Antichrist we were talking about down to this point because um, he came out of the Greek Empire of Daniel's. And so then um, we see that um, there's a transition uh, until we get to verse 23 that this kind of overlaps and covers both of them. I think in uh, verse 14 then we look at the 2300 days um, that is described as 2300 evenings and mornings then. And so that was 2300 days was then. This is not, see we're trying to fit this into the three and a half years, I think, you know, with seven, seven years tribulation and it's divided in half, uh, three and a half years. And, and, and we try to take these days and try to make it mesh and, and it just don't fit. And the reason it don't fit is because it's not supposed to. Uh, this is for the time of the Anti Antiochus when he desecrated the temple and offered uh, swine on the altar and offered uh, uh, made an offering to Zeus and so uh, they're, they're different things so don't try to make this fit with the timetable of three and a half years and the seven years uh, over in the book of Revelation now the interpretation of the vision uh, the reason we already know a lot of this stuff is because here it is. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when I came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. Now, Warren Wiersbe, uh, in his book, Daniel, be resolute. Uh, Daniel is a good, he says this, Daniel is a good example for students of prophecy to follow. He asked the Lord for the explanation in eight, verse 15 there, uh, and allowed the Lord to instruct him. It wasn't a matter of satisfying curiosity or trying to appear very knowledgeable before others. He was concerned about his people. Too many prophetic students don't, want, don't wait before the God uh, for instruction and insight. Instead, they try to display their knowledge and impress people with what they think they know. The old exercise is purely academic, and it's all in the head, head and never changes the hearts. Uh, now, there, uh, let me just add this. There's all kinds of people today, and, and Warren Rearsby also said uh, one time, and this is why I like his... Uh, uh, to read after him so much and, and uh, you know some of his stuff is in here influencing but most of I've just did this studying history and, and studying the word of God and uh, but we have the same idea in a sense not that I'm anything near like Warren Risby uh, but he said that he'd been to a lot of uh, prophecy conferences he said, I've seen a lot of prophecy, you know, proclaimed and things. But he said, I've rarely seen it brought down to a practical level. And uh, as I know I've made that statement many times, that's what drew me to the book of Daniel, the practical lessons. Uh, the practical lessons, the sovereignty of God that we see, and also, uh, also the prophecy. But prophecy is last to me. Um, of course, it, you know, it will take over more importance, and it does gradually. Uh, as time goes on and it's becoming more so now uh, but that's what first drew me to it now <clears throat> there's plenty of people that want to call themselves prophets um, I would be careful uh, the Bible says that if 
man claims to be a prophet to weigh the tail whether he really is or not. If he misses one prophecy, if he's wrong, if he's in error on it, then he's not a prophet of God. Um, so I, I would be scared to put myself in that category, I'll be honest with you. Uh, some people want to call themselves that, um, be known by that, or you want to call people that, that's, you know, a different matter. Uh, I just say you have to be careful. I've seen some stuff that's way out there that you really do need to avoid. I can remember um, one instance of some guy that had a uh, prophecy college, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, just in a few minutes. Guy's not in any trouble, and so he's um, uh, on top of everything. Uh, when he can, uh, comes back, in the end times, and we're looking forward to that day, it could be any time, uh, we're looking forward to that day, then it's not going to be a nail biter. Uh, God's going to take care of things in short order. It's, like I say, it's not going to be a nail, bite, nail biter. So we don't need to be biting our nails. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to be uh, difficult in the meantime. Uh, some bad times are going to come. Uh, but there is no equal to God. He has no equal. Satan is not close to being equal, uh, even though he thought he could be, uh, ev evidently, or he wouldn't have been so foolish as to think he could rebel against God and take over his place. Now, I will make um, another interesting note here also. Uh, Hannibal of Carthage died, as I said, about 184 to 183 B.C. Um, when Antiochus IV Epiphanes would have been in his early 30s, so it would be highly likely that Hannibal was acquainted with him. And after fleeing Carthage, some years after his defeat there by Rome, uh, he allied with Antiochus' his father and served as a naval commander. However, Rome defeated Antiochus III, also known as Antiochus the Great. Uh, he was the father of Epiphanes at the Battle of Magnesia in 190 B.C. And one of the demands of Rome was hostages, one of which was Antiochus III's son, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. Uh, Hannibal once again was forced to flee, but was later betrayed, seeing no way of escape. He committed suicide by drinking poison about 184 or 183 B.C. Now, uh, so we can see their lives overlapping here. Um, in 187 B.C., Antiochus III was murdered uh, in a Baal temple near Susa where he was exacting tribute in order to obtain much needed revenue to pay the tribute to Rome. Um, and so uh, after his father's death, Antiochus IV, older brother, took the throne, but he was soon assassinated. Now, at some point, Antiochus IV had been released by Rome and he killed his brother's assassin and he took the throne back um, into his family. Uh, at that time. Now, <clears throat> so that's uh, kind of the history behind what's going on uh, here. And so Antiochus, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was a wicked, wicked man. Um, uh, as wicked as he come, uh, like I say, he, he was a picture of the Antichrist, probably uh, more so than any person in history. We can look at uh, Hitler, we can look at uh, uh, different figures down through uh, the centuries, uh, but none fits. Maybe he didn't kill as many Jews as Hitler did, but none fit the uh, things that were done uh, as much as Antiochus Pisphanes did as what the Antichrist will actually do. In verse 13, it says, Now I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the Regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and, um, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot. Now, uh, that term uh, uh, in the um, King James is desolation of, uh, abomination of desolation, uh, which basically means the same thing. And um, <clears throat> so uh, that applies to the Antichrist. It, it also applies to uh, what Antiochus Epiphanes did. 
They said to me for 2,300 evenings, 2,300 evenings and mornings, then sanctuary should be restored to its rightful state. Um, probably counting from the death of Ananias III, the high priest that was murdered in 170 B.C., until 164 when Judas Maccabeus in uh, 164 cleansed the temple. Um, now, we oftentimes, and I used to do that too, and, and most uh, commentaries, uh, or at least many of them do, try to fit this in with um, the time in Revelation and other places in the Bible. But um, uh, that can be a little bit of a mistake there. Uh, as I said, we're seeing a transitioning here between, uh, until we get down to verse 23, uh, into the time of the Antichrist, when he's talking more about him. Uh, but we're still dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. And so that was 2,300 days was then. This is not, see, so we're trying to fit this into the three and a half years, I think, you know, with seven, seven years tribulation, and it's divided in half, uh, so three and a half years, and, and, and we try to take these days and try to make it mesh, and, and it just don't fit. And the reason it don't fit is because it's not supposed to. Uh, this is for the time of the Anti Antiochus, when he desecrated the temple and offered uh, swine on the altar and offered uh, uh, made an offering to Zeus. And so uh, they're, they're different things. So don't try to make this fit with the timetable of three and a half years and the seven years uh, over in the book of Revelation. Now, the interpretation of the vision. Uh, the reason we already know a lot of this stuff is because here it is. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when I came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. Now, Warren Wiersbe, uh, in his book, Daniel, be resolute. Uh, Daniel is a good, he says this, Daniel is a good example for students of prophecy to follow. He asked the Lord for the explanation in eight, verse 15 there, uh, and allowed the Lord to instruct him. It wasn't a matter of satisfying curiosity or trying to appear very knowledgeable before others. He was concerned about his people. Too many prophetic students don't, want, don't wait before the God uh, for instruction and insight. Instead, they try to display their knowledge and impress people with what they think they know. The old exercise is purely academic, and it's all in the head, head and never changes the hearts. Uh, now, there, uh, let me just add this. There's all kinds of people today, and, and Warren Rearsby also said uh, one time, and this is why I like his... Uh, uh, to read after him so much and, and uh, you know some of his stuff is in here influencing but mostly I've just did this studying history and, and studying the word of God and uh, but we have the same idea in a sense not that I'm anything near like Warren Risby uh, but he said that he'd been to a lot of uh, prophecy conferences he said, I've seen a lot of prophecy, you know, proclaimed and things. But he said, I've rarely seen it brought down to a practical level. And uh, as I know I've made that statement many times, that's what drew me to the book of Daniel, the practical lessons. Uh, the practical lessons, the sovereignty of God that we see, and also, uh, also the prophecy. But prophecy is last to me. Um, of course, it, you know, it will take over more importance, and it does gradually. Uh, as time goes on and it's becoming more so now uh, but that's what first drew me to it 